Welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind, conversations on leadership, coaching, and team building. Your host, Terry Pettit, led the University of Nebraska Cornhusker volleyball team from 1977 to 1999 and coached Nebraska's first ever national championship in 1995. Today, Coach Pettit mentors coaches, authors books, and presents to corporations and businesses on leadership and team building. Uh, this is Terry Pettit, the host of Inside the Coaching Mind. And I'm joined with our producer, uh, David Young. Uh, I'm also pleased to announce today that we are collaborating with um, Lee Feinswag and Volleyball Magazine and our uh, podcasts and our video podcasts will be uh, available at uh, volleyball.com, which probably covers volleyball better than any other uh, media outlet. And uh, particularly pleased today to have uh, Danny Busboom uh, Boomer, Kelly, uh, the head coach of the uh, women's volleyball team at uh, the University of Louisville, which is currently 23-0 and and ranked number one in the country. Danny, welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, what a, you know, there, there's been, th this podcast is, is going to have a lot of Husker references in it. <laughs> a lot of Louisville re references in it. Um, uh, uh, several people <clears throat> that have played at Nebraska have got on into coaching uh, at high school and college level. People like uh, Renee Saunders, who's won several state championships in a row, but Karen Dahlgren coached at Kansas and Nikki Best at Montana and Christy Johnson at uh, Iowa State. But you are, you are the first former Husker to coach a team that became number one in Division One volleyball, and uh, what a wonderful uh, accomplishment! And and uh, I think you knew this was likely to happen when Texas lost to Baylor this past week. But um, what was the response from your team? What was the response from your department, the school, the community? Yeah, our our team was jacked, and. What's cool about our team this year, and I know we'll dive into them deeper, but our leadership is so awesome. And so, you know, th they knew it was coming, but they take every, like, they're very proud of their accomplishments, but not to the point where it deters us. So we were watching that Texas Baylor game as a team. We were on the road and everybody got pretty pumped when they saw Baylor win, because we knew we, you know, we'd be number one and make history and, um, so it was a pretty special moment. And then the community has been awesome. You know, I, you know, went to the men's basketball game for a little bit last night and tons of people, you know, congrats coach and everybody's paying attention to Louisville volleyball. And I think they were, you know, before this year, but this year it's really drawn people into like really know what's going on and get to know the players and have a better understanding for the game. Um, and obviously the university is proud and, the women's sports here are celebrated at such a high level. So, you know, I'm just trying to stay on par with women's basketball and field hockey who are, you know, having great seasons and have tremendous programs. How do you keep this in perspective with, um, I suppose, everyone, you know, because sometimes people think, yeah. wow, you're ranked number one. Now you're supposed to, <laughs> you're supposed to definitely uh, win every match you play. Yeah, uh, that's tough because I, I don't know if there's a huge, uh, great understanding of how hard it is to do do that. And, you know, even being at Nebraska and, and Nebraska is obviously a great program, been ranked number one many, many times. You know, you realize just how hard it is. That's hard where, wherever you're at. And to be the first team in the ACC to do it, um, I think should tell people that it's hard in this part of the country and, you know, the ACC has been behind in the past, and I think we're definitely catching up to, to the other power fives. But, um, yeah, I think that's a challenge because it's like, okay, now you should win it all. And, you know, this is going to be an expectation every year. And the reality is this, this is a potentially a once in a, you know, hopefully not, but potentially once in a, like, program lifetime um, accomplishment. So yeah. you um, don't know when you're going to be in this position again. Exactly, and, uh, and 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 particularly in a in a couple of years here, we've had the pandemic, where you, where you had the opportunity to to bring back a couple of key players, as did 
most programs. Right. Um, in, in some programs, it seems like uh, some of those players have kind of hit the wall, the fifth and sixth year players. In other programs like yours, they've they've really relished the opportunity maybe to experience something that they haven't experienced. When you were a, when you were a high school uh, athlete, you were a multi-sport athlete, you played basketball. Um, I think you may have won this, this, the state in hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, are, I'm, I'm guessing that a good percentage of the athletes on your, on your roster are multi-sport athletes. Yeah, you know, quite a few are, um, but we have, you know, Louisville tends to be a little more specialized community just because the high school volleyball is, is so good here and the club volleyball is really good. They start playing, you know, year round. So I'd say it's about split, you know, 50-50 of those that played other sports and, and those that really focused on volleyball. And you're one of those rare people who is a multi-position athlete yeah. in, in college. Uh, uh, your first three years, you were a setter at Nebraska in 2006. You're on a national championship team with, um, boy, a lot of talent. Two, two players become international stars. Sarah Pavin plays for several years in the Olympics uh, for the Canadian beach team. And Jordan Larson recently was named as the best player ever to wear a United States uniform and leads her team to the uh, Olympic gold medal. I believe Christina Hotelling was a freshman, didn't play much, but she went on to be a, uh, an, a national player of the year. You had a couple other All-Americans on that team, Danny Mancuso. At, at what point in the spring in 2006 does John Cook, the head coach, come to you and say, Danny, uh, I, I would like to you to move from setter to uh, libro. Well, you know, I, that was my senior year. And so I had been with John for three years and obviously knew him in the recruiting process. And I was really upset in 05 when we lost to Washington. And I remember my mom being like, you know, geez, you're like really overly upset about this game. Well, we did lose in the national championship, but I, I knew that I would never set again at Nebraska. I just knew it. So it was not. Well, why, why did why did you know that? Because Rachel Holloway was already there. And so she graduated high school a whole year early. So she was training in our gym. And I knew that, you know, we fell short in 05. And I, I just, I had a feeling so that, that Rachel would be the next setter and she deservedly. So she was insane, very, very talented. And, um, so when John told me, of course, I still, I wasn't happy about it. Yeah, I've trained for three years. I'd never set in high school. So I had to work really hard to, to become a good setter. And I just felt like all that work was out the window. But once I got over the, the initial, you know, being upset or whatever you want to call it, a tantrum of my own kind. <laughs> I, um, it was the best year and, you know, libero really suited my personality and, um, you know, it was either switch positions or sit the bench. So I, I was lucky that I was a great athlete and I had the tools to be able to do that and be a, a good, good libero. How did he know that you could pass? Well, I was an outside hitter all through club. Right. And so I, th I think it was just like hoping that I could pick up that skill pretty, pretty quickly. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, oddly enough, the first year the Libro came in, John didn't use it. This was in 2001. I was head of the rules committee then. And, you know, he had a set system and was happy with it. So, so he, uh, uh, didn't use it. But I guess my feeling today is that when I look at a team, when I evaluate a team, I look at, at those two positions first, setter and libro. If you have those two, you can compete. You can compete in, in every every match. And I think uh, everyone knew that uh, Tori Dilfer, your setter, was very good and she would be returning. But you have a fresh and libro. Mm -hmm. And I looked at your stats the other day I've never seen a stat like the reception errors for your Libro. She has four. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're talking four, mm -hmm. four in 23 matches. 
So that's over probably close to 80 sets. She has four reception errors. I've never seen, I've never seen a stat like that. Mm -hmm. Why is she so good? And who are we talking about? Oh, this is Elena Scott. And so I think it's, it's cool. You bring up that I switch positions and, you know, we did that with uh, Justine Wangarantes at Nebraska. So Elena Scott spent, was a setter her whole life, never played libero until she came to Louisville. And so she came to camp as a setter and just really talented setter, knows how to win, high volleyball IQ, but she's a little bit small um, for that position. And we just started serving her balls and seeing what she could do passing wise. And like, wow, this kid might be a great libero. And then the more we watched her play, no, I was just like, I got to have this kid in our program. And I think what makes her so good is she's just really confident um, and in her skills, but she has an insane volleyball IQ. And she reminds me of Justine in that way is just makes plays where it's like, makes it look so effortless. Um, and, you know, I'm challenging her more to be more aggressive. And she's like, well, I don't, you know, if, let's say Anna De Beers are outside. She's passing well. I don't want to take balls from her. It's like, no, that's your job. You should be taking as many balls as you possibly can. Um, but she's talented. I told her in the recruiting process, she could be the national team libero someday. So I didn't know she'd be that good this year, but I really believe she could be very, very special libero. You know, I, um, early, a couple of weeks ago, I asked you if you were familiar with the phrase rups, runs. Yeah. Uh, Adolph Rupp was the men's basketball coach at Kentucky, and he had a team in the 1960s that was ranked number one in the country, and the center was 6'4". And you do have some size. I mean, you have your middles are 6'3 and 6'2", and you've got a right side that's 6'2". Your left side's six foot, which, mm -hmm. it, which is probably a little undersized. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at Wisconsin with a 6'9 right side player and a 6'8 middle, and, and you look at Texas, and, and one of Texas middles looks like she's on an escalator every time she runs a yeah. slide. Um, you're, a, you're a good size Division I team, but not an extremely uh, big team. I think that's, that's the first thing I noticed. The second thing is, uh, going back to that team that you won a national championship with in 2006, you had two players that went on and played at a very high level internationally. Um, I don't know if Jordan was ever National Player of the Year. Mm -mm. Uh, Pavin was, but Jordan certainly could have been. Um, when you look at Wisconsin, uh, Retke has that potential. Uh, Fecky certainly had that potential uh, in uh, 2015 when you were an assistant coach at Nebraska. She didn't get it, but she, she certainly could have. Um, but your team, uh, a little bit like Kentucky last year, it, it is, um, is a pretty balanced team. I mean, you're averaging, your hitters are averaging three kills per set to two kills per set. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that player that's averaging five and a half kills per set. Um, what are the strengths of that? And what are the challenges? Yeah, the, the strengths are just that I, I, you can't really prep for just one player on our team. And, you know, when we think about big matches we've won this year, it's been somebody different that's kind of had a great game. So, you know, if somebody's off a little bit, we don't have to worry or there's, there's no panic, you know, it's, I think we still feel good and they contribute in other ways, but it is challenging for that same reason when, when you don't have somebody that has taken over a match in tough moments, it's kind of like, well, who, who do I go to here? And, you know, it just, you have to have a lot of trust and that's not easy all the time. Yeah. I, and I haven't watched you enough to say this, but I kind of had the feeling may, De Beer is only a sophomore, correct? Mm -hmm. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I, she's very effective out of the back row. And when you have a player that can do that, it, it, it means that in any situation, she also, at least in the, her personality appears to be pretty even, mm -hmm. pretty steady. Very. And, uh, and I think that that's an important factor to have in, uh, in big matches. 
Another thing that you have going for you, and I don't know if you feel this, but when when we won our first national championship in 95, Nebraska Omaha won a national championship the next year. And I remember Rose Majors saying it was it was very helpful to have Nebraska accomplish that because their players kind of looked around and said, well, we could do that. Mm -hmm. Did did Kentucky winning last year have that impact on you and your players? You know, I've thought about that. And I think, I don't know if it was Kentucky specifically, but just having somebody different win it definitely had a, had an impact and like, well, we're right there with, with Kentucky and, um, we, we can do this. And I do think the hype around the state and, you know, you could just, everybody was so excited, even in the city of Louisville, there's obviously a ton of Kentucky fans here. It, it just gave our players extra motivation to, to be in that position and to put themselves in an opportunity to, to win one. Yeah. I, somebody asked me what, if I was going to go back into coaching, what conference, this was a few years ago, what conference would I want to be in? And I said the ACC and they said, why? And I said, well, because there's been a lot of good coaches, a lot of good teams in the ACC, but you don't have a situation there like you have in the Big Ten or the Pac-12 where you have two or three programs that are seen as uh, kind of the uh, ultra programs. In the, in the Big Ten, it would be Nebraska and Penn State. In the Pac-12, it would be USC, Stanford, UCLA. So you've had Duke win the conference. You've had UCLA win the conference years ago, North Carolina State, Florida State, Pitt. Um, do you think that was an advantage coming in as a coach? Definitely. And I, I felt the same way. Like this is a conference that, you know, we, we could beat that team someday, but that looks, you know, okay. Louisville's always in the hunt to win and um, it's not going to take years and years and years to do that. So I 100% feel, feel the same way. Um, you know, and UNC and Florida state had a, a stretch there where they kind of ran the show, but when you look at the history, yeah, it's been so many teams have won. I think Clemson might've won one. Um, so it's been a lot of teams. Right. And it certainly helps this year. I don't think you can accomplish what you, what you've accomplished if Dan Fisher doesn't do what he's done at Pitt, you have to have other teams that are capable of playing a, at your level and mm -hmm. it, and Georgia Tech is having you know that kind of year and you mentioned Florida State Florida State beat Florida and year in year out they've been very good but I know um, we won the the national championship in 95 the year after the first year ever we'd lost the conference championship to Colorado mm -hmm. we needed somebody uh, somebody to emerge. You're going to be playing Pitt at Pitt later this year. You played them in a five-set match, a very close five-set match um, mm -hmm. earlier this year. Um, some of the conferences like the SEC and the Big 12 are playing back-to-back. -back. Uh, and I understand why they're doing that for travel reasons. To me, uh, in some ways, that's harder. Yeah, it's, you know, you're up all night. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean the players. I mean, <laughs> the, <laughs> the coaching staff is up all night figuring what what do we do, mm -hmm. uh, which brings about another question. What percentage of your time you're playing on the on average now two matches a week? Mm -hmm. What percent of your time in practice is opponent prep? What percent is player development? Yeah, you know, we probably spend no more than 20% on opponent. I mean, it depends on the day, but um, I, I, we, I just see a lot more value in our side of the net. And I think our players this year are very, very good at understanding a scouting report. And so we don't have to like hammer that home over and over again. It's like, we can work on it and feel good about it, but we, again, don't need to, continually go over it to make sure they understand because they do. So we spend more on player development for sure. Um, and especially now that we've hit the part of conference where we're going to play teams twice. So um, we feel like we know those 
athletes and can even focus more. And, you know, right now it's about how do we find a couple more points here and there on our side of the net. So, um, so, been- so for example, Tori Delfer is a, a fifth year mm-hmm. player, grad. What can she get better at? I mean, what, what is she working on to get better at? You know, for for her, we're working on just being a little more creative. Our offense is pretty simple, but I, I like that. But I do think one point here or there, a match, she could maybe th- throw it around, for lack of a better term, a little bit more and, um, you know, be a little more aggressive setting our middles. They're super effective and really physical, so we don't need a perfect pass to set them. But, you know, and then I think she goes in spurts a little bit with her back setting that that can get a little iffy. So Iko Jones is one of those players in 2019. She won us a Texas match. It was, I mean, she played the game of her career probably. Um, but how, how do we keep her engaged and make sure she's in a good rhythm? Mm-hmm. But yeah. And then her defense, I mean, there's a lot I could say. Tori's a, a huge, huge reason, maybe the biggest while we're in, why we are in this position, but I can nitpick on setter's game quite a bit. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So you think uh, a lot of leadership, would you, you know, would you say yeah. your leadership um, comes from her or does it come from a core group of people? You know, it's a core group, but she's the encore general. And um, I just think she sets an incredible example. Like she does not take plays off. I've not won in practice. And when you have your setter doing that, it bleeds into the rest of the team. And, you know, she's also worked really, really hard at her leadership and she's able to take feedback and really work to change and be better. And not very many players are when you're, when you're discussing, you know, a personality, that's tough, it's tough to hear sometimes, but that's, what's made her really special and made her a great leader this year in particular. She comes from an athletic family and, um, you know, what types of things do you look at? I mean, we all know what we want in a setter. We'd like quick feet. We'd like somebody that understands the game. But what are the intangibles that you look for in that position that that some people might not recognize? Yeah, I think the, the first one is how hard how hard can she work? And you know, like I said, she doesn't take any plays off. And and then you know, I guess I didn't really know Tori. She's a transfer, and we recruited her really quick. Um, she came here actually, you know, we didn't have a scholarship at the time. We had a freshman setter who we were really high on coming in and told her, like, I don't know if you need to come here and be happy running a five, one running a six, two or sitting the bench. Cause I honestly have no, I can't say one way or the other, or even lean towards one thing or the other. And so just that she, she puts a ton of trust in the coaching staff and, to have your leader do that as well, just it's, it's huge. So I don't ever feel like our team is questioning us. And part of that is because Tori wouldn't let that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, So that and hard work and high level of trust. And then she's just very adaptable. Like I said, I, I've never had a player have to work so hard on their leadership or want to work that hard and make as drastic changes as she has. How often do you call something from the bench when you're siding out? Uh, Very yeah, rarely. Uh, pretty rare. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, Depends. Uh, Maybe like once a, a whole game, once or twice in a whole match. Yeah. You mentioned your middles, Anna Stevenson, sitting 446. Mm-hmm. I think I'd want to get her the ball a little more too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and your other middle uh, is, is uh, I think, hitting 391. So. Uh, you know, you're, you're obviously doing a good job. This doesn't come about just because of, of one person. Talk a little bit about your staff. Dan mm-hmm. meski has been with you. He was, he was an assistant at Nebraska with you. Mm-hmm. When you got the, the uh, Louisville job, you brought him on board. What is, talk about Dan and what he does yeah. for Louisville. Dan's, Dan's huge for, for our team. And he, you know, is the, defensive coordinator if you want to call call him that so he runs our scouts and preps us for opponents and trains our middles but he also he thinks like a head coach and so you know when we're in a group and or in a tough timeout or in between games two and three he has ability to 
give a great message. And I think that's really important, especially for me with Louisville being my first, you know, head coaching job and that it wasn't just always on me. And I had somebody that was really experienced and confident that they could take some of those moments and take a lot of pressure off of me. Um, so he, he's huge and he's great. Our middles, you know, you've seen them transform over the years and, you know, that's, that's because of him and he watches tons of film and gets them fired up about, you know, being the best middles in the conference and the best blockers in the country. So, and then Todd Chamberlain's another assistant and he came from Kansas. He's actually from Louisville and he, saw Kansas go, you know, from middle of the pack big 12 to a final four. So having that perspective, I think has been, you know, huge too. So now he's basically taken two teams from, you know, average quote unquote average to, you know, to top of their conferences. So. Right. It's You've got cool. a volunteer assistant, Linda Hampton, Keith, I think she was the head coach at North Carolina state. Um, when somebody like that calls and says, hey, I'd like to be a part of your staff for a year or two, what are the things you have to consider? Uh, it, it just, you know, because she was a head coach and, you know, how is she going to be able to handle being a volunteer and, you know, not having as much input or, and she has a lot of input. I don't mean that, but like not, you know, she's basically behind Dan Todd and me. Um so I just want to make, wanted to make sure that she was ready for that and could handle that. And I also felt like it was a no low risk situation for us. <laughs> it's like a volunteer. It's like, she's probably going to bring a lot. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And so um, I really felt like she could help us in the recruiting area and organization in the office, not just on the court where a normal, like a younger volunteer, I think brings a lot to the court, but maybe not very much in the office setting. So I was excited to see what she, how she could impact that. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I look at John Cook, if somebody said, what's John's talent, I would say it's his will. His, he doesn't let go. He mm -hmm. just, you know, it's his grit. Uh, what, what's Danny Busboom's talent? I, I don't know. That's, that's, that's hard to say. Um, well, talent is something you do. You can do at a certain level a high level every day. And you could do it if you were selling cars, you could do it if you were repairing refrigerators, if you were teaching school. What does Danny Busboom do at an exceptional level? Um, I guess I'd say maybe two things that come to my mind. I'm, I'm very consistent. So, and I think that allows me to build trust quickly and so I think our, our team has, and our program has so much trust, but that comes from like, I, players know what they're going to get. You know, we are very transparent with, with the whole team. Like we don't have very many closed door meetings with one player. If we're going to talk to what somebody needs to work on, we usually talk about it in front of everybody. So there's no, uh, it's just easy to hold each other accountable. So I don't, I don't know. That's a good question, but. Well, but you just hit on something pretty important, de developing trust. And you said, one of the things we do is that we don't have one-on-one -on -one meetings. We don't talk about another player with somebody. How else do you develop trust? What other ways, what other ways can a coach develop trust? You know, I think that that's, that's been huge for us is just, you know, being really open and honest with the whole team and making sure everybody understands each other's roles, not just their own. Um, I think our staff has a tremendous amount of trust. So when you see us, when our team sees us in the gym, even outside the gym, you know, I, it's easy for them to like, we can teach them by acting, you know, and, and acting is not even the right word, but by, you know, how we're interacting with each other. We have great managers who we give a lot of responsibility to. So I think it just starts at the top that everybody's roles are celebrated and equally important, no matter if it's me or the freshman manager. Um, I think that helps, helps a ton. Um, and then, you know, really developing those leaders. Like I said, like Tori, I really feel like she, and all of our seniors do, but they have our backs and, if anybody wants to complain or 
doubt, like they're not going to let that happen. Right. Uh, I, I'm guessing it also is helpful to have a program like Kiva in Louisville for a couple reasons. One, there are pe there are, there are kids playing volleyball there, which certainly helps. Secondly, I'm I'm sure they're hosting tournaments there. And so other players come in from other areas of the country. Mm -hmm. While they're there, maybe they can visit your campus. Is that is that a real plus? For sure. And we have tons of great players coming through the city of Louisville. Um, I, I do think it's interesting because people bring that up a lot. Like, of course, Louisville should be good. There's so much volleyball right, you know, in in your area. But people don't realize there's also I don't know. I don't even know how many to count, like six to eight major division one programs that are really, really good within three, 400 miles. So our competition for recruiting is insanely difficult. So we have great players, but to land those, you know, you can say, I want to get out of town or I, I want to stay close to home. Well, there's about five programs that are within a couple hours that two, three hours that are competing, you know, in the top, 15 right now. So it's tough to you, the hometown sell is not quite as easy as you would think, especially, you know, I grew up in Nebraska and everybody wants to go to Nebraska, but here it's like, you have Kentucky up the road, Purdue's a couple hours away, Michigan and Michigan state aren't far, Illinois is four hours. So, and that's just the ones I can think about top of my head, but those are all great programs. Right. What'd you learn from John cook? What'd you take from John Cook that you apply to your own coaching? You know, a lot. So the organization of practices, and that's one huge plus that having Dan on my staff is, you know, we could just jump right in day one and kind of no expectations of the pace of practice and the structure. So I think John does that better than anybody. Um, you know, I think what I talked about is letting – other people have huge roles. I think John also does a great job of developing his coaches and letting them, you know, have a lot of say, whether that's practice or scouting or recruiting. And, you know, he never tries to do it all himself. So that's one thing, you know, when I talked to Lizzie Stemke, who was a assistant of John's and who went to Georgia and isn't in coaching anymore, but she said she really regretted that, like just trying to do everything and it made her a worse coach. So I definitely took that to heart. Um, you know, and then I think fighting for what the program needs and John always told me, don't go somewhere where you have to fight for every little thing. Cause it's going to, you're going to drive yourself crazy. And, um, you know, at Louisville, of course, we're always fighting for more. Every program hopefully is to raise the level of volleyball and, you know, what volleyball athletes are getting, but we're really well supported. So when I have to fight for something, it's something big. It's not something small. And um, I'll, I always remember when he told me that it's probably my third year in. And so I took that to heart when, when I was thinking about taking a head job. Yeah. Well, do you see yourself uh, maybe moving into a larger venue for some matches? I hope so. You know, the, we have the Yum Center here, which is an unbelievable venue, but it holds 22,000 people. So it's very, very large. And so you don't want to take away the intimate feeling that we have right now. But I also want to be able to share with more people in the community. And, you know, all of our games are pretty much sold out. So only a few people get to watch us live. So next year, we're looking to move you know, we'll move a handful down to the Yum Center every year. And that also help us get ready to host the Final Four in 2024. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's certainly wonderful. Um, I was very impressed. I think it was 2012 that uh, Louisville, or as Julie Herman called it, Louisville, uh, hosted the national championship. And I went down to the uh, Louisville Slugger uh, uh, Bat Company and Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something I'm going to suggest to you is that you go down there and say, we need to have a, 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 a bat made that's a celebration of Louisville volleyball uh, becoming the number one uh, team in the country. And when they agree to do that, I'll buy the first bat. Okay, I love it. It's a great idea. <laughs> Danny, thanks so much for, for being on here. 
I, I'm, I'm rooting for you. I hope that you have a, a, a wonderful season and that you get to, to uh, play in that national championship match. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. It was a wonderful conversation with um, Danny Busboom Kelly. Uh, I want to thank Danny. I want to thank our producer, David Young. I want to thank uh, uh, Lee Feinswag and uh, Volleyball Magazine. And, we're, and uh, you can get that at volleyball.com. But uh, look forward to, to future podcasts and uh, a future relationship with uh, with Volleyball Magazine. So if you want to see other podcasts, you can go to terrypettit.com or go on YouTube to Terry Pettit and uh, you can find uh, podcasts with Karch Karai, Jordan Larson, Tom Hilbert, John Cook, Kirsten Booth, uh, Christy Johnson, Lori Endicott, and many others. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. That's it for this episode of Inside the Coaching Mind with your host, Coach Terry Pettit. Be sure to subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to have you leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your friends by tweeting, posting on Facebook, emailing, or just talking about it over a cup of coffee. All the ways to subscribe are posted on terrypettit.com. And don't forget to look for our Facebook group, Inside the Coaching Mind with Terry Pettit. I'm Dave Young. We'll talk to you next time for the next episode of Inside the Coaching Mind.